Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari Life of Battista Franco, Painter of Venice Battista Franco of Venice, having given his attention in his early childhood to design, went off at the age of twenty as one who aimed at perfection in that art to Rome, where, after he had devoted himself for some time with much study to design, and had seen the manner of various masters, he resolved that he would not study or seek to imitate any other works but the drawings, paintings, and sculptures of Michelagnolo. Wherefore, having set himself to make research, there remained no sketch, study, or even anything copied by Michelagnolo that he had not drawn. Wherefore, no long time passed before he became one of the first draftsmen who frequented the chapel of Michelagnolo, and, what was more, he would not for a time set himself to paint or to do any other thing but draw. But in the year 1536, festive preparations of a grand and sumptuous kind being arranged by Antonio de San Gallo for the coming of the Emperor Charles V, in which, as has been related in another place, all the craftsmen, good and bad, were employed, Raffaello de Montelupo, who had to execute the decorations of the Ponte Sant'Angelo, with the ten statues that were placed upon it, having seen that Battista was a young man of good parts and a finished draughtsman, resolved to bring it about that he also should be employed, and, by hook or by crook, to have some work given to him to do. And so, having spoken of this to San Gallo, he so contrived that Battista was commissioned to execute in fresco four large scenes in Chioscuro on the front of the Porta Capena, now called the Porta de San Bastiano, through which the emperor was to enter. In that work, Battista, without having hitherto touched colors, executed over the gate the arms of Pope Paul III and those of the Emperor Charles, with a Romulus who was placing on the arms of the pontiff a papal crown, and on those of the emperor an imperial crown, which Romulus, a figure of five brachia, dressed in the ancient manner, with a crown on the head, had on the right hand Numa Pompilius, and on the left Tullus Hostilius, and above him these words, Quirinus Pater, in one of the scenes that were on the faces of the towers, standing on either side of the gate, was the elder Scipio triumphing over Carthage, which he had made tributary to the Roman people, and on the other, on the right hand, was the triumph of the younger Scipio, who had ruined and destroyed that same city. In one of the two pictures that were on the exterior of the towers on the front side could be seen Hannibal under the walls of Rome, driven back by the tempest, and on the other, on the left, Flaccus entering by that gate to succor Rome against that same Hannibal. All these scenes and pictures, being Battista's first paintings, and in comparison with those of the others, were passing good and much extolled. And if Battista had begun from the first to paint, and from time to time to practice using colors and handling brushes, there is no doubt that he would have surpassed many craftsmen. But his obstinate adherence to a certain opinion that many others hold, who persuade themselves that draftsmanship is enough for him who wishes to paint, did him no little harm. For all that, however, he acquitted himself much better than did some of those who executed the scenes on the arch of San Marco, on which there were eight scenes, four on each side, the best of which were painted partly by Francesco Salviati, and partly by a certain Martino and other young Germans who had come to Rome at that very time in order to learn. 
Nor will I omit to tell in this connection that the above-named Martino, who was very able in works in Chioscuro, executed some battle scenes with such boldness and such beautiful inventions in certain encounters and deeds of arms between Christians and Turks that nothing better could have been done. And the marvelous thing was that Martino and his assistants executed those canvases with such assiduity and rapidity in order that the work might be finished in time that they never quitted their labor, and since drink, and that good Greco, was continually being brought to them, what with their being constantly drunk, and inflamed with the heat of the wine, and their facility in execution, they achieved wonders. Wherefore, when Salviati, Battista, and Calavrisi saw the work of these men, they confessed that for him who wishes to be a painter it is necessary to begin to handle brushes in good time, which matter, having afterwards considered more carefully in his own mind, Battista began not to give so much study to finishing his drawings, and at times to use color. Montelupo, then going to Florence, where, in like manner, very great preparations were being made for the reception of the above-named emperor, Battista went with him, and when they arrived, they found those preparations well on the way to completion. But Battista, being set to work, made a base all covered with figures and trophies for the statue on the Canto de Carnesecchi that Fra Giovanni Agnolo Montorsoli had executed. Having therefore become known among the craftsmen as a young man of good parts and ability, he was much employed afterwards at the coming of Madama Margarita of Austria, the wife of Duke Alessandro, and particularly in the festive preparations that Giorgio Vasari made in the palace of Messer Ottaviano de' Medici, where that lady was to reside. These festivities finished, Battista set himself to draw with the greatest industry the statues of Michelagnolo that are in the new sacristy of San Lorenzo to which at that time all the painters and sculptors of Florence had flocked to draw and to work in relief, and among these Battista made no little proficience, but nevertheless it was recognized that he had committed an error in never consenting to draw from the life and to use colors, or to do anything but imitate statues and little else besides which had given his manner a hardness and dryness that he was not able to shake off, nor could he prevent his works from having a hard and angular quality, as may be seen from a canvas in which he depicted with much pains and labor the Roman Lucretia violated by Tarquinius. Consorting thus with the others and frequenting that sacristy, Battista formed a friendship with the sculptor Bartolomeo Amanati, who was studying the works of Buonarti there in company with many others. And of such a kind was that friendship that Amanati took Battista into his house as well as Genga of Urbino, and they lived thus in company for some time, attending with much profit to the studies of art. Duke Alessandro, having then been done to death in the year 1536, and Signor Cosimo de Medici elected in his place, many of the servants of the dead duke remained in the service of the new, but others did not, and among those who went away was the above-named Giorgio Vasari, who returned to Arezzo, with the intention of having nothing more to do with courts, having lost Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, his first lord, and then Duke Alessandro. But he brought it about that Battista was invited to serve Duke Cosimo, and to work in his guardaroba, where he painted in a large picture Pope Clement and Cardinal Ippolito, copying them from a work by Fran Sebastiano 
and from one by Tiziano, and Duke Alessandro from a picture by Pantormo. This picture was not of that perfection that was expected, but having seen in the same guardaroba the cartoon of the Noli Me Tangeri by Michelagnolo, which Pantormo had previously executed in colors, he set himself to make a cartoon like it, but with larger figures, which done, he painted a picture from it, wherein he acquitted himself much better in the coloring. And the cartoon, which he copied exactly after that of Michelagnolo, was executed with great patience and very beautiful. The affair of Monte Marlo having then taken place, in which the exiles and rebels hostile to the duke were routed and captured, Battista depicted with beautiful invention a scene of the battle fought there mingled with poetic fantasies of his own, which was much extolled, although there were recognized in the armed encounter and in the taking of the prisoners many things copied bodily from the works and drawings of Bornarti. For the battle was in the distance, and in the foreground were the huntsmen of Ganymede who were standing there gazing at Jove's eagle carrying the young man away into heaven, which part Battista took from the design of Michelagnolo in order to use it to signify that the young duke had risen by the grace of God from the midst of his friends into heaven, or some such thing. This scene, I say, was first drawn by Battista in a cartoon, and then painted with supreme diligence in a picture, and it is now, together with his other works mentioned above, in the upper apartments of the Pitti Palace, which his most illustrious excellency has just caused to be completely finished. Having thus been engaged on these and some other works in the service of the duke, until the time when he took to wife the lady Donna Leonora of Toledo, Battista was next employed in the festive preparations for those nuptials on the triumphal arch at the Porta al Prato, where Ridolfo Ghirlandajo caused him to execute some scenes of the actions of Signor Giovanni, father of Duke Cosimo. In one of these, that lord could be seen passing the rivers Po and Ada, in the presence of Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who became Pope Clement the Seventh, Signor Prospero Colonna, and other lords and in another was the scene of the delivering of San Secondo. On the other side, Battista painted in another scene the city of Milan, and around it the camp of the League, which on departing the above-named Signor Giovanni leaves there. On the right flank of the arch he painted on one side a picture of Opportunity, who, having her tresses all unbound, was offering them with one hand to Signor Giovanni, and on the other side Mars, who was likewise offering him his sword. In another scene under the arch, by the hand of Battista, was Signor Giovanni, fighting between the Tassino and Biagrasa upon the Ponte Rozzo, defending it, as it were, like another Horatius, with incredible bravery. Opposite to this was the taking of Caravaggio, and in the center of the battle, Signor Giovanni, who was passing fearlessly through fire and sword in the midst of the hostile army. Between the columns on the right hand there was in an oval garlasso taken by the same lord with a single company of soldiers, and on the left hand, between the two other columns, the bastion of Milan, likewise taken from the enemy. On the fronton, which was at the back of anyone entering, was the same Signor Giovanni, on horseback, under the walls of Milan, when, tilting in single combat with a knight, he ran him through from side to side with his lance. 
above the great cornice which reached out to the other cornice on which the pediment rested in another large scene executed by Battista with much diligence there was in the centre the emperor charles v who crowned with laurel was seated on a rock with the sceptre in his hand at his feet lay the river betis with a vase that poured water from two mouths and beside that figure was the river danube which with seven mouths was pouring its waters into the sea i shall not make mention here of the vast number of statues that accompanied the above-named pictures and others on that arch for the reason that it is enough for me at the present moment to describe that which concerns battista franco and it is not my office to give an account of all that was done by others in the festive preparations for those nuptials and described at great length besides which having spoken of the masters of those statues where the necessity arose it would be superfluous for me to say anything about them here and particularly because the statues are not now standing so that they cannot be seen and considered but to return to batista the best thing that he did for those nuptials was one of the ten above-mentioned pictures which were in the decorations in the great court of the medici palace wherein he painted in chioscuro duke cosimo invested with all the ducal insignia but for all the diligence that he used there he was surpassed by bronzino and by others who had less design than himself in invention in boldness and in the treatment of the chioscuro for as has been said before pictures must be executed with facility and the parts set in their places with judgment and without that effort and that labor which make things appear hard and crude besides which overmuch study often makes them come out heavy and dark and spoils them while lingering over them so long takes away the grace boldness and excellence that facility is wont to give them and these qualities although they come in great measure as gifts from nature can also in part be acquired by study and art having then been taken by ridolfo ghirlandajo to the madonna de vertigli in valdechiana which place was once attached to the monastery of the angeli of the order of camaldoli in florence and is now an independent body in place of the monastery of san benedetto which being without the porta a pinti was destroyed on account of the siege of florence battista painted there the scenes in the cloister already mentioned while ridolfo was executing the altarpiece and the ornaments of the high altar these finished as has been related in the life of ridolfo they adorned with other pictures that holy place which is very celebrated and renowned for the many miracles that are wrought there by the virgin mother of the son of god Battista then returned to Rome at the very time when the judgment of Michelagnolo had just been uncovered, and being a zealous student of the manner and works of that master, he gazed at it very gladly, and in infinite admiration made drawings of it all and then having resolved to remain in Rome at the commission of Cardinal Francesco Cornaro who had rebuilt the palace that he occupied beside san pietro which looks out on the portico in the direction of the campo santo he painted over the stucco a loggia that looks towards the piazza making there a kind of grotesques all full of little scenes and figures which work executed with much labor and diligence was held to be very beautiful about the same time which was the year fifteen thirty eight francesco salviati having painted a scene in fresco in the company of the misericordia 
was to give it the final completion and to set his hand to others, which many private citizens desired to have painted, but by reason of the rivalry that there was between him and Jacopo del Conte, nothing more was done which hearing, Battista sought to obtain by this means an opportunity to prove himself superior to Francesco, and the best master in Rome. And he so went to work, employing his friends and other means, that Monsignor della Casa, after seeing a design by his hand, allotted the work to him. Thereupon, setting his hand to it, he painted there in fresco St. John the Baptist, taken at the command of Herod, and cast into prison. But although this picture was executed with much labor, it was not held to be equal by a great measure to that of Salviati, from its having been painted with very great effort, and in a manner crude and melancholy, while it had no order in the composition, nor in a single part any of that grace and charm of coloring which Francesco's work possessed. And from this it may be concluded that those men are deceived who, in pursuing this art, give all their attention to executing well and with a good knowledge of muscles a torso, an arm, a leg, or other member, believing that a good grasp of that part is the whole secret, for the reason that the part of a work is not the whole and only he carries it to perfect completion in a good and beautiful manner who after executing the parts well knows how to make them fit in due proportion into the whole and who moreover so contrives that the composition of the figures expresses and produces well and without confusion the effect that it should produce and above all care must be taken to make the heads vivacious spirited gracious and beautiful in the expressions the manner not crude and the nudes so tinted with black that they may have relief melting gradually into the distance according as may be required to say nothing of the perspective views landscapes and other parts that good pictures demand nor that in making use of the works of others a man should proceed in such a manner that this may not be too easily recognized. Batista thus became aware too late that he had wasted time beyond all reason over the minutiae of muscles and over drawing with too great diligence while paying no attention to the other fields of art. Having finished that work, which brought him little praise, Battista transferred himself, by means of Bartolomeo Genga, to the service of the Duke of Urbino, to paint a very large vaulting in the church and chapel attached to the palace of Urbino. Having arrived there, he set himself straightway to make the designs according as the invention presented itself in the work without giving it any further thought, and without making any compartments. And so, in imitation of the judgment of Buonarti, he depicted in a heaven the glory of the saints, who are dispersed over that vaulting on certain clouds, with all the choirs of the angels about a Madonna, who, having ascended into heaven, is received by Christ, who is in the act of crowning her while in various separate groups stand the patriarchs, the prophets, the sibyls, the apostles, the martyrs, the confessors, and the virgins, which figures in their different attitudes reveal their rejoicing at the advent of that glorious virgin. This invention would certainly have given Battista a great opportunity to prove himself an able master, if he had chosen a better way, not only making himself well practiced in fresco colors, but also proceeding with better order and judgment than he displayed in all his labor. But he used in this work the same methods as in all his others, for he made always the same figures, the same countenances, the same members, and the same draperies 
besides which the colouring was without any charm, and everything laboured and executed with difficulty. When all was finished, therefore, it gave little satisfaction to Duke Guidobaldo Genga and all the others who were expecting great things from that master, equal to the beautiful design that he had shown to them in the beginning. For in truth, in making beautiful designs, Battista had no peer and could be called an able man which, recognizing, the duke thought that his designs would succeed very well if carried into execution by those who were fashioning vases of clay so excellently at Castel Dorante, for which they had availed themselves much of the prince of Raffaello da Rubino and other able masters, and he caused Battista to draw innumerable designs which, when put into execution in that sort of clay, the most kindly of all that there are in Italy, produced a rare result. Wherefore vases were made in such numbers, and of as many kinds as would have sufficed to do honor to the credence of a king, and the pictures that were painted on them would not have been better if they had been executed in oils by the most excellent masters. Of these vases, which in the quality of the clay much resemble the kind that was wrought at Arezzo in ancient times, in the days of Porsena, king of Tuscany, the above-named Duke Guidobaldo sent enough for a double credence to the Emperor Charles V, and a set to Cardinal Farnese, the brother of Signora Vittoria, his consort and it is right that it should be known that of this kind of paintings on vases, in so far as we can judge, the Romans had none, for the vases of those times, filled with the ashes of their dead, or used for other purposes, are covered with figures hatched and grounded with only one color, either black or red or white nor have they ever that lustrous glazing or that charm and variety of paintings which have been seen and still are seen in our own times nor can it be said that if perchance they did have such things the paintings have been consumed by time and by their having been buried for the reason that we see our own resisting the assaults of time and every other danger insomuch that it may even be said that they might remain four thousand years under the ground without the paintings being spoilt. Now, although vases and paintings of that kind are made throughout all Italy, yet the best and most beautiful works in clay are those that are wrought, as I have said, at Castel Durante, a place in the state of Urbino, and those of Faenza, the best of which are for the most part of a very pure white, with few paintings, and those in the center or on the edges, but delicate and pleasing enough. But to return to Battista, for the nuptials of the above-mentioned Lord Duke and Signora Vittoria Farnese, which took place afterwards at Urbino, he, assisted by his young men, executed on the arches erected by Genga, who was the head of the festive preparations, all the historical pictures that were painted upon them. Now, since the duke doubted that Battista would not finish in time, the undertaking being very great, he sent for Giorgio Vasari, who at that time was painting at Rimini, for the white friars of Scolsa, of the order of Monte Alavito, a large chapel in fresco, and an altarpiece in oils for their high altar, to the end that he might go to the aid of Genga and Battista in those preparations. But Vasari, feeling indisposed, made his excuses to his excellency, and wrote to him that he should have no doubt, for the reason that the talents and knowledge of Battista were such that he would have everything finished in time, as indeed in the end he did. 
Giorgio then going, after finishing his works at Rimini, to visit that duke and to make his excuses in person, his excellency caused him to examine, to the end that he might value it, the above-mentioned chapel that had been painted by Battista, which Vasari much extolled, recommending the ability of that master, who was largely rewarded by the great liberality of that lord. It is true, however, that Battista was not at that time in Urbino, but in Rome, where he was engaged in drawing not only the statues but all the antiquities of that city, and in making, as he did, a great book of them, which was a praiseworthy work. Now, while Battista was giving his attention to drawing in Rome, Messer Giovanni Andrea del Angulera, a man truly distinguished in certain forms of poetry, having got together a company of various choice spirits, was causing very rich scenery and decorations to be prepared in the large hall of Sant Apostolo, in order to perform comedies by various authors before gentlemen, lords, and great persons. He had caused seats to be made for the spectators of different ranks, and for the cardinals and other great prelates he had prepared certain rooms from which, through jealousies, they could see and hear without being seen. And since in that company there were painters, sculptors, architects, and men who were to perform the dramas and to fulfill other offices, Battista and Amanati, having been chosen of the company, were given the charge of preparing the scenery, with some stories and ornaments in painting, which Battista executed so well, together with some statues that Amanati made, that he was very highly extolled for them. But the great expenses of that place exceeded the means available, so that Messer Giovanni Andrea and the others were forced to remove the prospect scene and the other ornaments from Sant Apostolo, and to convey them into the new temple of San Biagio in the Strada Giulia. There, Battista, having once more arranged everything, many comedies were performed with extraordinary satisfaction to the people and courtiers of Rome and from this origin there sprang in time the players who travel around called the Zanni. After these things, having come to the year 1550, Battista executed in company with Girolamo Siciolante of Sermonetta for Cardinal de Cisus on the façade of his palace the coat of arms of Pope Julius III, who had been newly elected pontiff, with three figures and some little boys, which were very much extolled. That finished, he painted in the Minerva, in a chapel built by a canon of San Pietro, and all adorned with stucco, some stories of the Madonna and of Jesus Christ in the compartments of the vaulting, which were the best works that he had ever executed up to that time. On one of the two walls he painted the Nativity of Jesus Christ with some shepherds and angels that are singing over the hut, and on the other the Resurrection of Christ with many soldiers in various attitudes about the sepulchre, and above each of those scenes in certain lunettes he executed some large prophets and finally on the altar wall he painted Christ crucified, Our Lady, St. John, St. Dominic, and some other saints in the niches, in all which he acquitted himself very well and like an excellent master. But since his earnings were scanty and the expenses of Rome very great, after having executed some works on cloth which had not much success, he returned to his native country of Venice, thinking by a change of country to change also his fortune. There, by reason of his fine manner of drawing, he was judged to be an able man, and a few days afterwards he was commissioned to execute an altarpiece in oils for the chapel of Monsignor Barbaro, 
patriarch-elect of Aquileia, in the church of San Francesco della Vigna, in which he painted St. John baptizing Christ in the Jordan, in the air, God the Father, at the foot, two little boys who are holding the vestments of Christ, in the angles, the Annunciation, and below these figures, the semblance of a canvas superimposed, with a good number of little nude figures of angels, demons, and souls in purgatory, and with an inscription that runs, In nomine Jesu omni genuflectatur. That work, which was certainly held to be very good, won him much credit and fame. Indeed, it was the reason that the Frati di Zoccoli, who have their seat in that place, and who have charge of the church of San Giobi in Canario, caused him to paint in the chapel of the Foscari, in that church of San Giobi, a Madonna, who is seated with the child in her arms, with a saint Mark on one side, and a female saint on the other and in the air some angels who are scattering flowers. In San Bartolomeo, at the tomb of Cristofano Fucheri, a German merchant, he executed a picture of abundance, mercury, and fame. For Messer Antonio della Vecchia, a Venetian, he painted in a picture with figures of the size of life and very beautiful Christ crowned with thorns and about them some Pharisees, who are mocking him. Meanwhile, there had been built of masonry in the palace of San Marco, after the design of Jacopo Sansovino, as will be related in the proper place, the staircase that leads from the first floor upwards, and it had been adorned with various designs in stucco by the sculptor Alessandro, a disciple of Sansovino and Battista painted very minute grotesques over it all, and in certain larger spaces a good number of figures in fresco, which have been extolled not a little by the craftsmen. And he then decorated the ceiling of the vestibule of that staircase. Not long afterwards, when, as has been related above, three pictures were given to each of the best and most renowned painters of Venice to paint for the library of San Marco, on the condition that he who should acquit himself best in the judgment of those magnificent senators was to receive, in addition to the usual payment, a chain of gold, Battista executed in that place three scenes with two philosophers between the windows, and acquitted himself very well, although he did not win the prize of honor, as we said above. After these works, having received from the patriarch Grimani the commission for a chapel in San Francesco della Vigna, which is the first on the left hand entering into the church, Battista set his hand to it and began to make very rich designs in stucco over the whole vaulting, with scenes of figures in fresco, laboring there with incredible diligence. But whether it was his own carelessness, or that he had executed some works, perchance on very fresh walls, as I have heard say, at the villas of certain gentlemen, before he had that chapel finished, he died, and it remained incomplete. It was finished afterwards by Federico Zucchero of Sant'Agnolo in Vado, a young and excellent painter, held to be among the best in Rome, who painted in fresco on the walls at the sides Mary Magdalene, being converted by the preaching of Christ and the raising of her brother Lazarus, which are pictures full of grace. And when the walls were finished, the same Federigo painted in the altarpiece the Adoration of the Magi, which was much extolled. Extraordinary credit and fame have come to Battista, who died in the year 1561, from his many printed designs, which are truly worthy to be praised. 
in the same city of Venice, and about the same time there lived, as he still does, a painter called Jacopo Tintoretto, who has delighted in all the arts, and particularly in playing various musical instruments, besides being agreeable in his every action, but in the matter of painting, swift, resolute, fantastic, and extravagant, and the most extraordinary brain that the art of painting has ever produced, as may be seen from all his works, and from the fantastic compositions of his scenes, executed by him in a fashion of his own, and contrary to the use of other painters. Indeed, he has surpassed even the limits of extravagance with the new and fanciful inventions and the strange vagaries of his intellect, working at haphazard and without design, as if to prove that art is but a jest. This master at times has left as finished works sketches still so rough that the brush strokes may be seen, done more by chance and vehemence than with judgment and design. He has painted almost every kind of picture, in fresco and in oils, with portraits from life, and at every price insomuch that with these methods he has executed, as he still does, the greater part of the pictures painted in Venice. And since in his youth he proved himself by many beautiful works a man of great judgment, if only he had recognized how great an advantage he had from nature, and had improved it by reasonable study, as has been done by those who have followed the beautiful manners of his predecessors, and had not dashed his work off by mere skill of hand, he would have been one of the greatest painters that Venice has ever had. Not that this prevents him from being a bold and able painter, and delicate, fanciful, and alert in spirit. Now, when it had been ordained by the Senate that Jacopo Tintoretto and Paolo Veronese, at that time young men of great promise, should each execute a scene in the hall of the great council, and Orazio, the son of Tiziano, another, Tintoretto painted in his scene Frederick Barbarossa being crowned by the Pope, depicting there a most beautiful building and about the pontiff a great number of cardinals and Venetian gentlemen, all portrayed from life, and at the foot the Pope's chapel of music. In all this he acquitted himself in such a manner that the picture can bear comparison with those of the others, not excepting that of the above-named Orazio, in which is a battle that was fought at Rome between the Germans of that Frederick and the Romans, near the Castello di Sant'Angelo and the Tiber. In this picture, among other things, is a horse in foreshortening, leaping over a soldier in armor, which is most beautiful. But some declare that Orazio was assisted in the work by his father, Tiziano. Beside these, Paolo Veronese, of whom there has been an account in The Life of Michel San Michel, painted in his scene the same Frederick Barbarossa, presenting himself at court, and kissing the hand of Pope Ottaviano, to the despite of Pope Alexander III. And in addition to that scene, which was very beautiful, Paolo painted over a window four large figures, time, union, with a bundle of rods, patience, and faith, in which he acquitted himself better than I could express in words. Not long afterwards, another scene being required in that hall, Tintoretto so went to work with the aid of friends and other means, that it was given to him to paint, whereupon he executed it in such a manner that it was a marvel, and that it deserves to be numbered among the best things that he ever did, so powerful in him was his determination that he would equal, if not vanquish and surpass, his rivals who had worked in that place. 
and the scene that he painted there, to the end that it may be known also by those who are not of the art, was Pope Alexander excommunicating and interdicting Barbarossa, and that Frederick therefore forbidding his subjects to render obedience any longer to the pontiff and among other fanciful things that are in this scene, that part is most beautiful in which the Pope and the Cardinals are throwing down torches and candles from a high place, as is done when some person is excommunicated. And below is a rabble of nude figures that are struggling for those torches and candles, the most lovely and pleasing effect in the world. Besides all this, certain bases, antiquities, and portraits of gentlemen that are dispersed throughout the scene are executed very well, and won him favor and fame with everyone. He therefore painted, for places below the work of Pordenone in the principal chapel of San Rocco, two pictures in oils as broad as the width of the whole chapel, namely about twelve braccia each in one he depicted a view in perspective as of a hospital filled with beds and sick persons in various attitudes who are being healed by san Rocco. and among these are some nude figures very well conceived and a dead body in foreshortening that is very beautiful in the other is a story, likewise, of San Rocco, full of most graceful and beautiful figures, and such, in short, that it is held to be one of the best works that this painter has executed. In a scene of the same size, in the center of the church, he painted Jesus Christ healing the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda, which is also a work held to be passing good. In the church of Santa Maria dell'Orto, where, as has been told above, Cristofano and his brother, painters of Brescia, painted the ceiling, Tintoretto has painted, that is, on canvas and in oils, the two walls of the principal chapel, which are twenty-two braccia in height, from the vaulting to the cornice at the foot. In that which is on the right hand, he has depicted Moses returning from the mount, where he had received the laws from God, and finding the people worshipping the golden calf, and opposite to that, in the other, is the universal judgment of the last day, painted with an extravagant invention that truly has in it something awesome and terrible by reason of the diversity of figures of either sex and all ages that are there, with vistas and distant views of the souls of the blessed and the damned. There also may be seen the boat of Sharon, but in a manner so different from that of others, that it is a thing beautiful and strange. If this fantastic invention had been executed with correct and well-ordered drawing, and if the painter had given diligent attention to the parts and to each particular detail, as he has done to the whole in expressing the confusion, turmoil, and terror of that day, it would have been a most stupendous picture, and whoever glances at it for a moment is struck with astonishment. But considering it afterwards minutely, it appears as if painted as a jest, the same master has painted in oils in that church, on the doors of the organ, Our Lady ascending the steps of the temple, which is a highly finished work, and the best executed and most gladsome picture that there is in that place. In Santa Maria Zebenigo, likewise on the doors of the organ, he has painted the conversion of St. Paul, but not with much care. In the Carita is an altarpiece by his hand of Christ taken down from the cross, and in the sacristy of San Sebastiano 
in competition with Paolo Veronese, who executed many pictures on the ceiling and the walls of that place, he painted over the presses Moses in the Desert and other scenes, which were continued afterwards by Natalino, a Venetian painter, and by others. The same Tintoretto then painted for the altar of the Pietà in San Giobi three Maries, St. Francis, St. Sebastian, and St. John, with a piece of landscape, and on the organ doors in the Church of the Servites, St. Augustine and St. Philip, and beneath them Cain killing his brother Abel. At the altar of the sacrament in San Felice, or rather on the ceiling of the tribune, he painted the four evangelists, and in the lunette above the altar an annunciation. In the other lunette, Christ praying on the Mount of Olives, and on the wall the last supper that he had with his apostles, and in San Francesco della Vigna on the altar of the deposition from the cross, there is by the same hand the Madonna in a swoon with the other Maries and some prophets. In the Scuola of San Marco, near Saints Giovanni e Polo, are four large scenes by his hand. In one of these is St. Mark, who, appearing in the air, is delivering one who is his votary from many torments that may be seen prepared for him, with various instruments of torture, which, being broken, the executioner was never able to employ them against that devout man. And in that scene is a great abundance of figures, foreshortenings, pieces of armor, buildings, portraits, and other such-like things, which render the work very ornate. In the second is a tempest of the sea, and St. Mark, likewise in the air, delivering another of his votaries. But that scene is by no means executed with the same diligence as that already described. In the third is a storm of rain, with the dead body of another of St. Mark's votaries, and his soul ascending into heaven. And there also is a composition of passing good figures. In the fourth, wherein an evil spirit is being exercised, he counterfeited in perspective a great logia, and at the end of it a fire that illumines it with many reflections. And in addition to those scenes, there is on the altar a Saint Mark by the same hand, which is a passing good picture. These works, then, and many others that are here passed over, it being enough to have made mention of the best, have been executed by Tintoretto with such rapidity that when it was thought that he had scarcely begun, he had finished. And it is a notable thing that, with the most extravagant ways in the world, he has always work to do, for the reason that, when his friendships and other means are not enough to obtain for him any particular work, even if he had to do it, I do not say at a low price, but without payment or by force, in one way or another, do it he would. And it is not long since, Tintoretto, having executed the Passion of Christ in a large picture in oils and on canvas, for the Scuola of San Rocco, the men of that company resolved to have some honorable and magnificent work painted on the ceiling above it, and therefore to allot that commission to that one among the painters that there were in Venice who should make the best and most beautiful design. Having therefore summoned Josefo Salviati, Federico Zucchero, who was in Venice at that time, Paolo Veronese, and Jacopo Tintoretto, they ordained that each of them should make a design, promising the work to him who should acquit himself best in this. While the others then were engaged with all possible diligence in making their designs, Tintoretto, having taken measurements of the size that the work was to be, 
sketched a great canvas, and painted it with his usual rapidity, without any one knowing about it, and then placed it where it was to stand. Whereupon the men of the company, having assembled one morning to see the designs and to make their award, they found that Tintoretto had completely finished the work and had placed it in position. At which, being angered against him, they said that they had called for designs and had not commissioned him to execute the work. But he answered them that this was his method of making designs, that he did not know how to proceed in any other manner, and that designs and models of works should always be after that fashion, so as to deceive no one and that, finally, if they would not pay him for the work and for his labor, he would make them a present of it. And after these words, although he had many contradictions, he so contrived that the work is still in the same place. In this canvas, then, there is painted a heaven with God the Father descending, with many angels to embrace San Rocco, and in the lowest part are many figures that signify, or rather represent the other principal scuole of Venice, such as the Carita, San Giovanni Evangelista, the Misericordia, San Marco, and San Teodoro, all executed after his usual manner. But since it would be too long a task to enumerate all the pictures of Tintoretto, let it be enough to have spoken of the above-named works of that master, who is a truly able man, and a painter worthy to be praised. There was in Venice about this same time a painter called Brazzacco, a protégé of the house of Grimani, who had been many years in Rome, and he was commissioned by favor to paint the ceiling in the great hall of the chiefs of the Council of Ten. But this master, knowing that he was not able to do it by himself, and that he had need of assistance, took as companions Paolo Veronese and Battista Farinato, dividing between himself and them nine pictures in oils that were destined for that place, namely, four ovals at the corners, four oblong pictures, and a larger oval in the center giving the last-named oval with three of the oblong pictures to Paolo Veronese, who painted therein a Jove who is hurling his thunderbolts against the vices, and other figures, he took for himself two of the smaller ovals with one of the oblong pictures and gave two ovals to Battista. In one of these pictures is Neptune, the god of the sea, and in each of the others two figures demonstrating the greatness and the tranquil and peaceful condition of Venice. Now, although all three of them acquitted themselves well, Paolo Veronese succeeded better than the others, and well deserved, therefore, that those signori should afterwards allot to him the other ceiling that is beside the above-named hall wherein he painted in oils, in company with Battista Farinato, a Saint Mark supported in the air by some angels, and lower down a Venice surrounded by faith, hope, and charity, which work, although it was beautiful, was not equal in excellence to the first. Paolo afterwards executed by himself in the Umilta, in a large oval of the ceiling, an assumption of Our Lady with other figures, which was a gladsome, beautiful, and well-conceived picture. Likewise, a good painter in our own day in that city has been Andrea Schiavone. I say good, because at times, for all his misfortunes, he has produced some good work and because he has always imitated as well as he has been able the manners of the good masters. But since the greater part of his works have been pictures that are dispersed among the houses of gentlemen, 
I shall speak only of some that are in public places. In the chapel of the family of Pellegrini, in the church of San Sebastiano at Venice, he has painted a St. James with two pilgrims. In the church of the Carmine, on the ceiling of the choir, he has executed an assumption with many angels and saints. And in the chapel of the presentation in the same church, he has painted the infant Christ, presented by his mother in the temple, with many portraits from life. But the best figure that is there is a woman suckling a child and wearing a yellow garment, who is executed in a certain manner that is used in Venice, dashed off or rather sketched, without being in any respect finished. Him, Giorgio Vasari caused in the year 1540 to paint on a large canvas in oils the battle that had been fought a short time before between Charles V and Barbarossa, and that work, which is one of the best that Andrea Schiavone ever executed, and truly very beautiful, is now in Florence, in the house of the heirs of the magnificent Messer Ottaviano de' Medici, to whom it was sent as a present by Vasari. <music> 